Wildfire is no stranger to Australia. It has stalked the ancient earth down through time, an elemental force in a primal land. For the earlier inhabitants, the Aborigines, fire was central to life. It was used by them for ritual, cooking, warmth, hunting, making grassland, and even fighting. It was in their myths, back in the mists of the sacred dream time. To explain the erratic behavior of bushfire, they said it traveled inside the ground. One legend said the source of fire was outside the world. When the white settlers came with their old world ways, they found the new land alien in its rhythms and extreme in its elements. Australia gives many blessings, yet it also floods and blows and dries and ignites easily. Living in southeastern Australia has always had an edge to it because along with California and the French Riviera, it is one of the most fire-prone regions in the world. Of the first big fire, back on February the 6th, 1851, the author Ralph Balderwood wrote, The fatal morning was abnormal, sultry, and breathless. The vaporous sky became lurid, darksome, awful. More than one terrified spectator believed that the last day had come, and not altogether without reason. The whole colony of Victoria was on fire at the same time. Many fiery events since the early days of white settlement up to the very recent times have burned themselves into the national memory. Some are named after the day of the week on which they occurred, so simple and so grim. Black Thursday, Red Tuesday, Black Friday. They all fell in February, the last month of the Australian summer. The words of Judge Leonard Stretton, the Royal Commissioner who inquired into the 1939 fires in Victoria when 71 people died, were still familiar. Of the days leading up to Black Friday, he said, for more than 20 years, the state of Victoria has not seen its countryside and forests in such travail. The rich plains denied their beneficent rains lay bare and baking. And the forests, from their foothills to the Alpine Heights, were tinder. There have been many more bushfire disasters also in South Australia and Tasmania. The fires that ringed Hobart in February 1967 killed 62 people. Each time afterwards, it was asked why such a thing had happened. In the summers following, people looked to the skies with fear and with good reason. Then came February the 16th, 1983, a day that would need no label. It already had one from the Bible. It was Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday, 1983, awoke uneasily in southeastern Australia. People had a foreboding that the day ahead of them would not go well. It was the first day of Lent, the time to seek atonement. In Melbourne, the weather forecast said it would be cloudy with some rain and a chance of afternoon thunderstorms. A warm to hot day with a light wind and a top temperature of 34 degrees. In Adelaide, the temperature soon reached 40. This was familiar enough at that time of the year. What made the people stir was the wind. It fanned their apprehension. Some of those early hour extrasensory impulses when people felt that they shouldn't leave their homes had some basis in what had already gone before. It had been the worst of summers, a willful season that showed no regard for the land or its people as it burned down upon them, inflicting great thirst. The summer was not entirely to blame. The previous winter, the traditional season for rain in this part of Australia had been barren. The hot days started coming early, draining away energy, making a wasteland. The heat coming down in waves under the glaze of the sun. Violently, it struck the air, making it shake. And when it came with the wind, it turned the ground to dust. It was so bad that farmers took their animals off the paddocks and onto the roads to search for food. Some drove their herds for hundreds of miles, but the drought stayed with them. 
Some tried to sell their stock at any price, to no avail. They even tried to give them away. Then they made the last gesture. After spending years raising their animals, they turned their guns upon them. One of the biggest shoots was in a corner paddock in northwestern Victoria, near a little town called Rapanyup. A huge pit was dug, and men and flocks came from all around. The sheep went down like flies. The soil was lined with blood, and the air was thick with the smell of waste and sorrow. Yet no complaining was heard. The farmers, whose families had roots in the district for generations, spoke of the rhythms of the good times and bad. The present affliction, they said, was part of nature's cycle. They accepted it. There was nothing else to do. Coping was called for, too, in the city, where people simply knew that they were running out of water. If the drought had any blessing in its curse, it was to make city people more aware of the true nature of water and what it meant to life. This brought them closer to the gardens in their care. The thirstiest gardens were those in the English style, delicate aliens. Some city people dug deep to find water, sinking bores into the dry earth. Householders saved their bath and laundry water for their gardens. Trenches were dug in the streets and parks. Old trees were treated with new love. Christmas came and gave some relief to the hardship because it brought goodwill and order. The January holidays came, but even then the elements were changeable. A cold snap hit Melbourne. Instead of air conditioners and ice cream, people bought heaters. It was strange to see so many public swimming pools deserted. Taunting clouds came and went through the long days, making and breaking promises, sending down only shadows. The great dry was daily news, with each item worse than the last. There was decay in the air and dying. What cultivation had survived was simply withering away. Remarks by Judge Stretton on the state of things before the Black Friday eruption of 1939 still applied. Dry heat and hot dry winds worked upon a land already dry to suck from it the last, least drop of moisture. As February began, the threat of fire intruded even more. There had already been several outbreaks. Some mines had become inflamed and snapped. And in the previous six months, a hundred fires had been lit on purpose. The elegant hills outside Adelaide were at risk, even among the wildflowers that bloomed in the heat. The hills people already had known fire exactly three years earlier, on another Ash Wednesday, when 70 homes had been wiped out, and they could hardly think it could happen to them again. There was a similar menace too at Mount Macedon, north of Melbourne. The setting for properties as old as early colonial history, Grand and gracious mansions and gardens, places like Derawit Heights, built in 1863 and valued in present terms for sale at a million dollars. The Great Ocean Road, as it was called, ran beside the sea in the southwest and was 50 years old. It was the best of both worlds, of bush and ocean, touched by the mountains behind and memories of green and gold. There was danger too in the Dandenong Ranges, not far east of Melbourne. Many people lived among the trees in something akin to a bush retreat, in places with such innocent names as Cockatoo, was a retreat from stress for some and from high prices for others. Usually the Dandenongs were so green that they were known as the city's lungs. Now those organs were hacking with dryness. Upheaval came to Melbourne on February the 8th, when a huge dry storm tore into the city made from the dust out west that had once been fertile earth. The day was thick with it, and people gasped and wondered what had befallen them. Yet still, some people didn't give definition to their fear and clung to fatalism. They knew something must happen. In this timeless land, Judge Stretton's remarks, poetic beyond their authority, were still apt. Men who had lived their lives in the bush went their ways in the shadow of dread expectancy. But though they felt the imminence of danger, they couldn't tell that it was to be far greater than they could imagine. They had not lived long enough.
the experience of the past could not guide them to an understanding of what might and did happen. With the coming of Ash Wednesday, the wheel had turned once more and was upon them. Ash Wednesday in Adelaide began as a deceitfully soft morning for news. There was a dust storm coming over the city and one or two small bushfires, but otherwise it was ordinary summertime, almost. It was hot, as expected. There was some worry about the wind, which gave a clue that perhaps not all would remain under control. Like the dust, it set teeth on edge and jingle jangled nerve ends. The first whisper of what was to come arose shortly before noon, when a fire was reported just south of the city. Others came quickly from the north, in the Adelaide Hills, in the southeast, and on the other side of the mountains. Within two hours, major fires were burning on six fronts. The early afternoon was besieged with the wailing of alarms and the smell of smoke and panic. It was the wind that did it, turning small fires into big ones, blowing them forward at 50 kilometers an hour and more. Chaos spread as quickly as the fires. Citizens with places in the hills were told to go home, but then later, they were ordered to keep away. Children had been sent home early from school because it had been so hot. The strong winds kept the fires coming, racing them up the gullies. In the Adelaide Hills, it was three years ago all over again. Only now, it would be many times worse. People who'd been missed by the last Ash Wednesday fires would not have the same good fortune this time. Fires moved at such speed that the thousands of volunteer firefighters now in action didn't know which way to turn next. The fires raced right up to the top of Mount Lofty where the city's television towers were. The fires stripped down the scale of everything, having no respect for history nor for wealth. Treasured old mansions went up along with new places. Brick or wood it made little difference. As confusion ran with the fires, the air over Adelaide was choked even more, and visibility became so bad that traffic stopped. The power went off in many places. People trying to get away to their homes were trapped in city lifts. Telephones died away, and rumors came to life, and people despaired for news of each other. The residents of the Anglican monastery at Mount Lofty crouched on the floor and prayed as it was caught by the flames. Yeah, we go, um, the fires trapped we many people. Unit, we Some got away. And he backed up. We couldn't move, and then he backed into us and wrecked our truck. But we did. We saved the house that we were sent in to stop anyway. How so fast we, was the fire moving then? Oh, crap, we don't know. It just goes on us. Here's our captain. He'll tell you more about it. Oh, our main power of the fire had gone past us. Um, we couldn't move because another truck had backed into us and done the radiator in. The fire went over the top was the first time. We thought we were pretty right, but the wind sprung up and uh, it seemed like a fireball went right over the top of us and just there cooked us. But 13 died in the southeast and another 12 in the Adelaide Hills. They died in their houses, in streets and in cars. Adelaide radio journalist Murray Nickel from 5DN got both the scoop and the shock of his life. At the moment, I'm watching my house burn down. I'm sitting out on the road in front of my own house where I've lived for 13 or 14 years. Uh, it's going down in front of me. The roof is falling and it's in flames and there's nothing I can do about it. Absolutely nothing. There's been a fire unit here from summer down pumping water till we ran out and, and the flames are in the roof. And, ah, uh, God damn it, it's just beyond belief. Uh, it's my own house, and uh, everything around is black. There are fires burning all around me, all around me. His broadcast tremored round the world. Later, people in other countries would imagine that half of Australia was in flames, and international telephone cables were jammed. Almost everything that moved was thrown in to try to stop the flames. Farmers did what they could to save their stock, but there was much suffering among the animals. Then at four o'clock, the wind changed, taking the fronts of the fires to even greater distances, 
and the smoke flooded everywhere. In the southeast, the little town of Kalangadu came under fierce attack. There were then a dozen major fires around Adelaide, and in the mid-north and the southeast. Firemen were told, save only lives and property, each unit for himself. People were dying terribly. <laughs> Phenomenal, just phenomenal. I just, boom, everything went. It's just incredible. Nobody can help anybody. You just know why you can. People assist anybody. It's just yeah. run for your life. It's all just. Brave firemen were burned too. Those who got away were branded with the sights they'd seen. Well, I was on the, using the hose on the back of the truck. I had the str hose stretched full length. When I turned around, the flames come up over the top of the hill that quick. I didn't have a chance to get back to the truck. The flames pushed me back. I had to turn around and run the other way. Burned arms, burned my back and my face. I said I hid behind a snowy pole to stop myself getting burned any further until it cleared up a bit. I couldn't see anything with the smoke and the wind. I just managed to see the lights of the truck come back. I jumped on that and then they picked me up, took me to the ambulance. And I ended up down here. Its previous good fortune deserted Greenhill in the hills, one of Adelaide's most affluent suburbs, where several people were killed. The wind picked up the embers and flung them through the foothills, making one run after another. And so it went on into the afternoon. How much stuff have you got? The refugees the took what they could. It was a time Why to think of priorities, with I've life the first. The but what possessions us. were the most important? Um, photos, Religious people tried to keep close to God. And I bought my Bible because that's the biggest gift of all. <laughs> Others carried with them only their fear. There was a lot of touching as people looked to succor one another. The fire tore away the normal social reserve and strangers hugged each other. By late afternoon, it was all fire. In the southeast, it came in from the west like an avenging host, now burning on a front of 120 kilometers. It swooped across the border into Victoria, sweeping everything in front of it, along with hopes of stopping. The hounds of hell were in full flight. By early afternoon in southern Victoria, it was well over 40 degrees when the first fires broke out. As in South Australia, no one had any idea of what was ahead. An early outbreak arose at Dean's Marsh, a small dairying place inland from the Great Ocean Road. The fire sprang in two directions, towards the coast and eastwards. One tore through the thick Otway Ranges, striking at the seaside town of Lawn, where it burned at the northern end. People further along the Great Ocean Road saw the smoke in the distance, but hardly dreamed that they too would soon be part of it. Another fire started at East Trentham, north of Melbourne, neighboring the grand old Macedon district, much of which would later be destroyed. The fire came south, first of all, through the Wombat State Forest. Once a haven, it would be no sanctuary this day for humankind, nor beast, nor bird. Further along the coast in the southwest, late in the afternoon, around Warrnambool, 100,000 hectares of rich dairy country would be lost and thousands of people evacuated. A third fire took off in the Dandenong Mountains to the east of Melbourne. In terms of loss of human life, this would be the worst of them, wiping out whole towns before it was done. Firemen along the Great Ocean Road waited by the sea, ready to move. Those who went in were soon driven back by the speed and heat of it, getting out with their lives and knowing that it was going to get worse. But even then, they didn't comprehend its force. Townspeople back along the road were still innocent. Even when the power went off, they wondered if it had been caused by a traffic accident. Some sat on their porches and sipped cool drinks and speculated. Men with horses in paddocks nearer the fire raced down the road through the police blocks to get them out. They brought them on foot all the way back. The neighbor came some stock was saved you know, and some was not. Me, you know, it's fire here. I said, my God, father will come out, you know. The stock is on the corner in that, that paddock. It's rugged paddock, you know, and the forest through next to it. But we get close, just couldn't get any, any closer. 
Early in the evening along the Great Ocean Road, the wind switched round to the southwest. It probably saved the rest of Lawn, which had been cut off when a bridge on the road had burned through. It sent the fire off and running back along the coast at enormous speed, covering 10 kilometers in eight minutes. It headed towards Ares Inlet and Anglesey, devouring huge sections of forest. The fire in the Dandenongs spread south and east, tearing through the bush and houses with equal rapacity. The hills were heaving with their flight. Trees groaned, wind moaned, bush burst asunder, and children cried out. From a long distance off in the air, the fire could be seen lurking beneath the dense foliage, like a kind of creeping lava. Firefighters went in all directions in the Dandenongs, trying to match the fickle ways of the fires, now generating their own winds. As they fought for some, their own homes elsewhere were lost, but they pitched in together. The only way to see the extent of the outbreak sweeping through Victoria was to fix the locations on a board at the Country Fire Authority headquarters, the centre of operations. But the picture kept changing so much. Tracking the fires became a deadly game of hide-and-seek as the fronts spotted ahead, sending out clumps of blazing bush that went forward like the wind, landed and started outbreaks afresh. People kept going, saving what they could, their lives first, then anything else. Keepers rounded up their animals, which were floundering over the countryside. At least, some of them had people to guide them. On the early evening of this dreadful day, late in summer, none of the usual bush sounds could be heard, none of the bird calls and the rustling of animals. Those that were left were fleeing for their lives. In place of that sweetness was the alarm of fire engines, the shuddering of helicopters, the war whoops of police cars and ambulances, the panic of people. Above, the smoke reached up past the clouds, swelling and bloating the evening sky, staining it with the mark of events down below. With it came the tremors of the people and the stench of fear among the gas of the gum trees that last summer had been so fragrant. Some of the sky itself was the color of burning. What breath was left below was being stripped of life, sucked at by the fires. The light was pallid and the sun went away well ahead of its time, leaving the country already spent. But the worst was yet to come. The daylight hours of Ash Wednesday were bad enough with so many simultaneous fires in South Australia and Victoria. But what would come with the night would be even more fearful. The fires came then with extra strength because of the wind. The people trying either to escape or fight depended on the fires for their light. But the effect was so strong that it distorted everything. In the small township of Tarpina, a fire took only 20 minutes to sweep from one end to the other. Down the Great Ocean Road about sunset, the wind suddenly switched round to the southwest. This sent the fire belting along the road back towards Melbourne, away from Lawn, which was lucky for the old town, but not for the others. Places alive in young and old memories were blitzed as if they were under wartime attack. There was great heat from the fires as they burned through towns and bush, right down to the shore, melting even the sand. Only the sea could stop them. They ripped through everything else, and the whole of the hills were alight. Aries Inlet and the adjoining areas of Eastern View, Moggs Creek and Fairhaven were the worst hit. The cement sheeted and timber houses with the life sucked out of them by the fire blew to bits. This was not just flames, it was a firestorm. A windstorm came in about 140 mile an hour and put fire from Clarksburg back into Aries Inlet and most of the trucks that they were waiting there, fire trucks and uh, emergency service were waiting there, were lucky actually to get, to get out of there with their lives, not alone their vehicles, because the wind was so strong and you couldn't see a couple of feet in front of you. It broke windscreens of cars and, and backs of cars and houses just 
lifted, lifted houses and roofs up hundreds of feet into the air and mattresses and they just floated around up in the sky. You could see them, you know, it was a fantastic sight to see but a terrible sight to see at the same time. The noise of the wind and the fire was like a thousand rushing trains. Cars were picked up and hurled away like toys. Birds, their feathers on fire, darted hither and thither like demented shooting stars. Down below, dogs howled. Everywhere houses were burning and people ran for their lives. Some got down to the beach as the police evacuated the town. People didn't know what to take with them. They dithered and took precious personal things, or food for the dog, or nothing at all. There was some hope of sanctuary further along the coast at Anglesey, another old seaside town. People had driven there bumper to bumper from Ares Inlet and beyond, but now this too was surrounded by fire and evacuated. The crowds swirled up the coastal highway, seeking anywhere to hide. You're as good as mine, I don't know. Many of them took to the beaches where they huddled through the night. Everything was black except for the fire. No one knew what was happening. People imagined terrible fates befalling their families and friends. And there were many amazing escapes. But I was all alone because my car wasn't working. And then the fire came and I saw the backyard starting to burn, so I got really scared and I jumped in the water tank. And I stayed there for a while and the smoke nearly choked me. And uh, after a while, I, when I didn't, you know, suffer from the smoke too much, I jumped out and uh, thought the best thing I could do was keep fighting the spot fires because things around the house started to burn and I got a wet towel, all the buckets we had, and uh, put out all the fires I could and it may have saved the house, it may not have, but uh, that's what I did. Up in the north, around Macedon, a firestorm hit late in the evening after the front switched course. It was hurled along by winds reaching 70 kilometers an hour and the fighters could do nothing but save lives. Thousands of people were evacuated to a racecourse, a church, a couple of halls, and a hotel. Some hid in their cars. The bush was shredded within a moment of being hit. In the Dandenongs, east of Melbourne, fires pushed by northerly winds were running on two fronts. The first, starting at Belgrave, raced to the main highway, where the wind shifted, turning it round and back through Upper Beaconsfield, with terrible results. The second fire, just north of Cockatoo, came down and wrecked the town. It missed the local kindergarten, where a hundred children had taken refuge, crouched under wet towels. Townsfolk crowded in the local car park. People died together or alone. A couple clung to each other in a ditch, and that was how they were found, in the final embrace. The leafy hollows, once home, became death traps. Timber houses were taken in one blow. Gas bottles exploded in great arcs of light. Firemen did their best. Some were so young in their new yellow overalls and shiny helmets. Over this single night, lambs would be turned into lions. Lost one already, I don't want to lose another one. Some died. Their mates kept going. No time yet for tears. No time to save so many places. No time for anything. But people tried. They improvised and kept at it, even when it was futile. Police, too, showed great heroism, going back through the flames to rescue people. At midnight, light rain began to drift through the Dandenongs, but it brought only mockery. The fires at that time became even worse. At Belgrave, it was so fierce that some people in Melbourne, 30 kilometers away, began to evacuate their homes, believing the fires to be much closer. At times, people had only their wits and their destinies to carry them through. Stories of survival became almost commonplace, yet each one was remarkable. Everyone was scared stiff because here in the kindergarten, my mother was there and I had to find her and I ran over there and there was a paraplegic lady there, you know, couldn't walk in there and I was carrying her across the road and all the flames come right from the bottom of the hill and they, all the sparks were running all the way up the hill, you know, until I got to the hall here. And I was trying to bring her over and it was, you know, quite a bit of a shock, actually. Were the people panicking? Yeah, everyone. It was, it was bumper to bumper all the way up, two cars wide. And, you know, like, like I was parked in the side and nobody would let you out. No one. I had to wait till they all went. People spoke in shorthand. Their perceptions either very sharp or shattered by what they'd seen, heard, felt. There's a roar of, uh, unbelievable roar. 
and it was panic that set in. Um, and I, you can't explain what happened there. It was just a wall of fire, 70, 80 foot high, travelling at 30 or 40 mile an hour, just engulfing everything that was in, it, in its path. And uh, unfortunately, there were humans in this case. You actually saw people running away oh, from yeah. the flames? Yes. Oh, well, we yeah. There were humans, but, uh, yeah, we're off to go now. We've got, we must go now. Yeah, Thanks very much. Yep. There was much yet to be done. The rest of the night was still ahead, still to be bled. The dawn of the next day after Ash Wednesday brought with it a sight that had nothing to do with the world as it had been known on the previous morning. The recognition from yesterday of towns and bush and mountains was gone. It was not Australia anymore. It was not anywhere. Instead, it was an anonymous place, a wasteland that was black and empty and hushed with people, strangers to it. It was such a soft dawn after such a hard night. When they'd escaped from the fire, people had tried to sleep, many of them done with fatigue, their bodies and minds overloaded. Who knows what dreams they'd had as they twitched and sighed before daybreak. Down on the great ocean road where crowds had fled to the beaches and even into the sea itself, they awoke early. They were groggy with fatigue, but also alert with their senses heightened. When they looked around them, they saw that only the ocean was unchanged. Three people had perished. If the fire had come the previous month, in the holiday season, the deaths could have been in the hundreds. Houses along the coast, once a haven for holiday makers, retired people, academics, honeymooners, artists, farmers and townspeople, looked as if a bomb had hit them. It might as well have. Such had been the ferocity of the firestorm that had come in the night. Over 700 houses had been destroyed along the coast. The worst hit areas were mere piles of ash when seen from the air, and not much more at ground level. The fire and the wind that went with it had torn places to pieces. Their interiors and contents were melted down and their bricks ripped open. Outside, paths were pushed away. Great blocks of stone shifted and huge trees torn asunder. The streets were littered with miles of lifeless power lines. The air was heavy with the rank smell of charred remains. The bush, once splendid, had been scorched so badly that what was left now seemed like the singed hide of an enormous ancient beast with the black paralyzed trees as its hair. There was a silence which chilled the warm morning. Everything and everyone was in shock. Those who returned that morning moved slowly and spoke quietly as if on a burial ground, which they were. Some just never came back, never again wanting to see where their roots had been torn asunder. Couples stood on the hillsides with their arms around each other, staring out to sea, not saying anything. Later, when people described what had happened that night, the memories of it came out of them in waves of shuddering. Their bodies contracted, their breathing became rapid, and their voices rose and fell with their pulses. They would do strange things that really made sense. One couple refused to sleep inside their house that had been saved. Instead, they lay down in their garden, fully dressed. A firefighter put all his clothes on the floor, as if dressing a dummy. He found it hard to sleep anyway, because when he closed his eyes, he didn't like what he saw. As unpredictable as the fire's behavior was the way in which houses had survived. There had seemed to be no order to it. This house would go and that one, but not perhaps the one in between or across the street. Sometimes, people whose houses had survived felt almost guilty about it, amid the suffering of friends and neighbours. The home of Dame Joan Hammond, the soprano who sang for the world from the 1940s until the mid-1960s, was left a melancholy wreck. Sighted back from the highway and with fine views of the sea from its wide windows and terraces, it had collapsed in great heaps of memories. Slowly, people straggled back to what had once meant something to them, their own place by the sea. They went through the ruins as softly as shadows, picking up things that had once been so familiar, looking at them and dropping them. They shook their heads in black wonder. They treaded through the remains of their dreams as though they were in another dream. It uh, represented, what, more than 30 years of your life? Oh, yes. I think um... I said, no, I know. 
on problems. Some were triumphant, the defiant ones who stayed behind and risked everything, even their lives. I've had it for so long, I said, I'm staying and fighting it. I did, and we beat it. The forest, once so full of so much life, was shrouded in deadly silence. The animals and birds extinguished, with only very few escaping. This koala's got quite severe burns, and um, it, it may not survive. I mean, the people who brought this in had their house burnt down. And I mean, two days later, they were looking after the wildlife in the area. Parts of the once blue Dandenong Ranges east of Melbourne were shriveled into blackened heaps. Some of the worst of the fires had come here, with great loss of human and other life. Cockatoo was no more. At Upper Beaconsfield, where the wind switched direction in the night and sped back to cover a kilometre in one and a half minutes, 12 firefighters died when they were trapped in trucks in a gully. 27 people died altogether in the Belgrave Heights, Cockatoo and Upper Beaconsfield area. Some had been taken in their homes, some while in flight. The people came back to those empty spaces because they had to, because it was home. They had nowhere else to go. They picked through the ruins almost casually, shrugging at seeing their places so readily destroyed. For the fire, nothing was sacred. In their hearts, they carried a great weight. But they had their lives, and sometimes a little more. He ran away. Many of them interviewed on that Thursday and during the next few days, declared that they would stay and build again. It wouldn't be without hardship, and not just physical hardship. Deep psychological wounds had been made. And months later, people would show depression, lethargy, dislocation and anger, and have bad dreams. The Australian people paid their respects. Very large sums of money were raised in public appeals, and welfare agencies were overwhelmed with donations of food, clothing, bedding and toys. Volunteers came from everywhere. People went to church and prayed, as on Sunday morning in Scots Church in Melbourne, attended by the then Prime Minister, Malcolm Fraser. By contrast, the fires diminished the election campaign raging at the time, touching people very deeply and softening the sense of confrontation that had been building up. People were moved in a way that was beyond politics. Early morning in the Mount Macedon area showed how much of the old houses, gardens, forest, trees in the streets, and civic centres had been reduced. It had been noted as an historic place, and now it was history indeed. Gardens over a hundred years old and shared by their owners with the public were gone. Derawit Heights, once called by its owner a happy home, was gone, along with several other mansions. Houses had gone down in droves, 400 of them altogether in the district. Mount Macedon's pub survived. A church built in 1874 was gone. The fire had moved so fast that even the fastest animals couldn't get away from it. Down on the highway at Gisborne, people came in from the morning after with the eyes and exhaustion of fighters who'd been to war. Australians are known for not making a fuss. That stoicism came through when they talked about what had happened to them. They didn't complain. I've lost a fair bit, well, I've, had, I've lost it before. <laughs> when did you lose it before? In 42. Whereabouts? Out there, uh, in this area, up the uh, Blackwood Road. You going to stay out here? You going to rebuild again? I don't know. I'm, uh... <clears throat> I couldn't say. I've got a couple of boys. There's a couple of them there. We, we may. It'll, that'll uh, remain to be seen. I'm getting a bit into the evening of my life. You're taking it very calmly, if I may say. Well, as I said, I went through it once before. The last time I was... Uh, I had a, uh, a leather apron and a, a pair of shorts and a, uh, a blue single. This time I've got a jumper. Altogether, 47 people died in Victoria and another 28 were lost in South Australia. It was one of the worst natural disasters in Australia's history of almost 200 years. Houses, farmland and stock losses were in the hundreds of millions of dollars. South Australia in the hills around Adelaide, in the north and down in the southeast, was sorely afflicted. Noble Mount Lofty had been humbled, and so had some of the great old establishments there. 
A treasure trove of artworks, photographs, and a world-class collection of 5,000 records were gone. Adelaide entrepreneur Kim Bonython said, I've lost everything, even down to the picture my mother had in the room in which she died, a little girl in Victorian costume standing in front of a bed of sunflowers, which reminded her of her own childhood. The fire also took the Anglican monastery St. Michael's house with its collection of 50,000 books, which included rare texts going back to the 1500s. It was the largest private library in Australia. The stock losses were enormous, with over 300,000 sheep lost. Greenhill had been the home of radio journalist Murray Nicholl and his wife Frankie. Greenhill was terribly stricken. Yarraby Road was where four people died, including an elderly woman in her home with her dog. For so many people that summer, the new great Australian dream to have not only a place of their own, but also to have it in the peace of the bushland had been turned back into the dust from which all things come. On the first Sunday after the fire, a service was held at Upper Beaconsfield to mark that life was starting again. The local Anglican church, St. John's, had been burned away, so it was decided to hold the service in the local public hall. Because of the shock of the fires and the dispersion of people who had no homes anymore, it was expected that only a few would attend. The event was not widely publicized. Suddenly, people started turning up in hundreds. The hall was too small, and they moved out onto the tennis court. The Reverend Philip Huggins said, it seemed to me that people would want to stay home in a private place or somewhere green, if they had a spiritual intent. But some deep intuition in them, some deep yearning for a sense of each other in this awesome but magnificent life, meant that people came and with their bodies really communicated what nobody could be prepared for. The scarred but surviving cross from St. John's was used to symbolize what had happened. We are able to recover from our burnt out church building and symbolizes that suffering and that experience. The hurt that's been done for the people of this community deep and a lasting impression on my mind. The words spoken to the assembly were like shafts, giving people something to which they could attach their deep feelings. People who'd never taken Holy Communion in their lives came forward to receive the sacrament. It sang and embraced and remembered. Then they joined hands together, these people who were not accustomed to touching one another, bound emotionally and finally, expressing the need to be together. Before the service, they'd been awkward, in movement and conversation, wanting neither to make small talk nor to speak of deep things. But the event released their tension. Afterwards, they started talking with each other. Once the first shock of the fires began to cool and the people and the land caught their breath again, the life that had been left beat with a new pulse. There was a resolution to make another start and that was what most people would do. For some, the fire's impact would leave its brand for a long time to come. People who lived through the fires had been touched very deeply in very private spaces by the experience. Many had seen an end to the material parts of their previous lives. But they'd also faced the very worst fear of them all, the fear of losing life itself, and this made many of them revalue those lives. The few remaining weeks of summer passed with little recognition of time, for Ash Wednesday had taken people beyond it. When they started to measure life again, they spoke of it in terms of before and after the fires, as the old life and the new one. When the autumn came, it gave a pause, a time for reflection, and a sign that there is indeed a season for everything. The memories of the fires would never be far away. On Sundays, when local fire brigades tested their sirens, people, in spite of themselves, would still be startled. It was a sound they would never forget. The winter brought with it rain, rest, and the smell of freshness. Gradually, in the blighted zones, the birds started to return, with a few calls here and there at first, then the sighting of a flock or two. Insects emerged from their underground sanctuaries and began their busy cycles. The occasional bush animal appeared, 
hopping through the ashes of the forests, hungry, frightened, but alive. This had been their home too, and would be so again. The resilience that came from seeing and knowing that life goes on was echoed by nature, who, as always, continued her rhythms. One of the most hopeful signs was found in the trees, which after Ash Wednesday had seemed so lifeless. Out of their blackness, as slowly and as gently as the sun rises and sets and rises, came tiny shoots. Against the darkness that had seemed to be everywhere, they were that most perfect color, green. It was the color of healing. <laughs>